Hello, my name is Julian Edgar and I'm the author of this book, Vehicle Aerodynamics, Testing, Modification and Development. A bit of an unusual video today. I want to look at understanding car aerodynamics through just one image. Let's take a look. So here's the image. It's from Mazda. It's of an older Mazda RX-7 and it's got all these weird arrows on it and a line that joins the heads of all the arrows. So what does it actually show? What it's showing is the aerodynamic air pressure that's acting down the center line of the car. So it's showing pressures. Those pressures can be below atmospheric, which you can think of as pulling on the panel, or they can be above atmospheric, which you can think of as pushing on the panel. So which is which on the diagram? Well, where there are arrows that are pulling away from the panel, it's a low pressure pulling on the panel. Where there are arrows that are pushing on the panel, it's a higher pressure pushing on the panel. And so you can see this thick line when it extends outwards from the car body, they're low pressure pulls. And when that line extends inwards from the body, it's a higher pressure push pulls. So the air pressure developed by the airflow over the bodywork has high and low pressures. Why is that important? Well, it's 90% of everything that's happening on the car in terms of aerodynamics. It's responsible for lift, it's responsible for downforce, it's responsible for drag, and it's responsible for thrust, the opposite of drag. And so the pressures that are acting on the car's body is nearly everything of the aerodynamics that are occurring on the car. And a bit the other 10%, the little bit that isn't, it's frictional drag over the surface of the body. So pressures, the pushes and the pulls, helps explain nearly everything that's happening aerodynamically. Now, a couple more things before we leave this slide and go to the next one, which is still showing the same image, but it's got different text. If you look carefully, you'll see that there's a certain pattern of pressures that relates to the shape of the car. Where airflow flows around a curve that way, a curve of that type, like the leading edge of the uh, hood or bonnet, the pressure is low. Where the airflow flows the other way is forced to change that way, like at the base of the windscreen, the windshield, the pressure is low. So the airflow wrapping around the top of the windscreen, low pressure. The airflow wrapping around this curve here, low pressure as well. So the shape of the car gives us a very good indication of whether they're going to be low pressures or high pressures, assuming that the airflow is attached to that surface, is actually following that surface. At the back of the car, the airflow is no longer following the surface, is no longer attached, and so a different mechanism occurs there, creating that low pressure. But at this stage, think of this uh, photo, think of this diagram as showing the pressures, the pushes and the pulls that are happening on the car's bodywork. So high pressures. I talked about high pressures as occurring where the airflow is forced to change direction. And on cars, there's very little high pressures on the upper surfaces. Base of the windscreen and the steeper the windscreen, the higher the pressure at the base of it until it gets too steep. And then the airflow can no longer get around that curve and sort of skips across. But assuming that we've actually got attached flow, the steeper the windscreen, the higher the pressure at the base of it. High pressure, of course, at the front of the car. That's a major cause of drag, pushing the car backwards. The airflow meeting this almost vertical surface and causing a pressure against it called the stagnation pressure. If you want to think of where the highest pressure is on the front of a car, it's typically the number plate uh, aiming forward, the registration plate. But we've also on this car got a little bit of high pressure at the very back caused no doubt by a rear spoiler, even though they don't show a spoiler on this diagram. But if you look at the whole car, you can see it's dominated by low pressures. And why is that important? Because it's trying to lift the car up off the ground. It's creating aerodynamic lift. Now, we've got lots and lots of low pressures, not many high pressures. And that's very, very important, as I say, for aerodynamic lift. What about low pressures? Where are the low pressures? Well, they're everywhere, all over the top. Nearly everywhere anyway. 
But what's been missing so far, and is missing from a lot of diagrams of this sort, is what is happening under the car. Now, on a car of this age, with a fairly rough underbody, the pressures are going to be moderately low. Okay, not very low, just moderately low. Similar in pressure, in fact, to those behind the car in what's called the wake. Now, you can see if the pressures under the car were of a similar magnitude, a similar size to the weight pressures, in other words, the arrows pointing downwards under here were similar to those uh, shown over here, we can see that the low pressures on top of the car would be much, much higher than the low pressures under the car, so we would still get aerodynamic lift. And a car of this era would certainly have aerodynamic lift and probably a fair bit of it as well. To get lower low pressures under the car, we need a smooth underbody, we need a rear diffuser, helps if we also have a slight downwards uh, motion of that uh, under tray under the engine. So we want to get low pressures under the car to try and pull the car downwards to offset those low pressures on top of the car pulling the car upwards. So it's a battle of the pressures. Low pressures under the car pulling the car downwards, low pressures on top of the car pulling the car upwards. And we can see now how the centerline pressures give us so much information about what's actually occurring on the car. Wake pressures. Let's talk about wake pressures in more detail. So we've been talking about attached flow, which means the airflow basically follows the mouse, follows the shape of the bodywork, and so the shape of the bodywork helps determine the pressures that are occurring. But when the airflow gets to the end of the car here, it separates and goes its own way. And so all of this area behind the car is in wake, Wake is the disturbed air behind the car, just like the wake in the water behind a boat that's moving forward. And wake pressures are low pressures. So the wake is trying to pull the car backwards. If we go to the front of the car, those high pressures are trying to push the car backwards. So total drag is made up primarily of the push of the high pressures on the front of the car and the pull of the low pressures behind the car in the wake. So one way of decreasing aerodynamic drag is to try and increase these weight pressures, make them so they're not so low, and so the pull back on the car isn't as great. So lift, downforce, drag, it's all created by these air pressures are acting on the bodywork of the car. Now, I mentioned drag, but at the very beginning of the video, I mentioned thrust. Thrust is air pressures trying to pull the car forward. And you might think, what? Thrust, thrust on a car, it doesn't have any. But look at the direction of these arrows. As the airflow wraps around the front leading edge, that nice curved edge of this bonnet, there's a pull forwards, there's a low pressure. And those arrows, if you want to talk about it technically, are the vectors showing force and direction. And some of those are trying to pull the car forward. So we want to maximize thrust on the leading surfaces and minimize low pressures drag on the rear surfaces to try and pull the car forward as much as possible. Of course, thrust never outweighs drag. All cars have drag, but you can see how curved surfaces on the front of the car are important in creating thrust and so reducing overall drag. Again, pressures. And underside pressures, I mentioned a bit earlier, we want them to be as low as possible to prevent the car from uh, trying to lift itself off the ground. Of course, cars don't fly as such, but they do um, have aerodynamic lift, which has problems for stability and problems for tire grip. And so we want those underside pressures to be as low as possible. As I said earlier, typically achieved by having a very smooth under tray with a very gentle rising diffuser. Now notice I put both together. I didn't say a tacked on diffuser at the back, a diffuser must work to be effective as part of the whole underside of the car. It's not just a little thing that's 12 inches long, got from, e got from eBay and stuck on the back. They basically do nothing. So you can see how aerodynamic pressures are absolutely critical to lift and drag. But the good news is you can measure all these pressures yourself on your car. 
Okay, the techniques covered in my book are really quite easy. They're cheap, they're straightforward, they're simple. You can do it on the road just with your normal car at normal speeds. You don't have to go really, really fast. And by measuring pressures, you can not only see how well your car is performing, like what are the underside pressures? Are they low enough to pull the car downwards? But you can also model the effect of things like rear spoilers. You can put a rear spoiler over here, and then you can see whether the pressures in front of it increase. They're not so low trying to lift the car. Perhaps they get above atmospheric and try and push the car downwards. You can, if you don't want to go for a full under tray, you can put a front air dam, a front spoiler down there and see if it actually changes the pressures under the car. So this isn't purely theoretical. This is something that you can do when you're modifying your car with cheap and simple equipment. And it is an absolute eye opener when you start measuring aerodynamic pressures because suddenly you can see all of this in action. It's not just theory in a YouTube video or in a book. It's practical, real stuff that you can do to modify your car. All in the book, Vehicle Aerodynamics, Testing, Modification and Development. The book is available from Amazon in your country right now. Thank you.